Hello, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to talk about frequency domain effects and about effects in general. This is essentially going to be a grab bag of various effects. It's going to be a little long, so please feel free to hit the pause button and wander away for a while if you need but I felt like there was no point in breaking it up arbitrarily, so I just wanted to go through a range, a bestiary, if you will, of effects that are used and talk about how they're built and how they work. Hope you're doing well out there. Let's go ahead and get started. So, when I talk about frequency domain effects, I'm really being a little loose here. Most effects have some time domain or frequency domain view, but here I'm talking about effects in this talk that can be thought of as appearing at least some degree as a manipulation in the frequency domain. And let's start out with tremolo and vibrato, which is an interesting pair of effects not the least because the nomenclature is hopeless at this point. Vibrato is a frequency domain effect. We oscillate the pitch of a signal, we waver it. And this is an effect that is pretty common. The, it can be done as an effect, but it can all, you know, by resampling would be the normal way. Or it can be done by just messing with the instrument itself. The most famous vibrato is that produced by the tremolo bar of a guitar which you may question if it produces vibrato why is it called the tremolo bar well because there's no very clear in practice distinction between these two things they're two separate effects but the names get confused a lot well then what's a tremolo effect well this is probably the easiest effect in audio you uh, waver the volume of the signal to produce a signal that's alternately louder and softer. So they're distinct effects, but they are often confused. I mean, confused is a strong word. Words mean what we want them to mean. And one is quite easy, and the other one is fairly hard. So... We've talked a lot about wah. I don't see any deep reason to belabor wah in this lecture. It's a classic frequency domain effect. You vary the pass band of a low pass filter because the human vo vocal tract goes wah, op opens out this low pass filter of your lips and mouth into a higher pass signal. And so it makes a really nice really nice thing. You've heard my sample implementation already, which uses FIR filters to do this. It's more typical when you're implementing a wah to use a IIR filter cascade because you want to keep the number of coefficients small so that you can tweak the effect, you know, tweak the band, pass band, cheaply in real time. I Fudged around with that by building a smaller bank of fixed filters and smoothing between them, but it would probably be better to actually have a sharp pass band that you sweep up and down. The normal structure for an IR filter in this situation is something called a biquad section. You can read about them at the link given here. And that makes things work a little better. You don't care so much about the problems with the IR filters if you're implementing them as biquads and you don't really care that much about the phase and other things because the effect is going to be a sort of novel effect anyway. Yes, it will distort the signal a little bit, but eh. Uh, there's really fancy demos up in the links there. I'm not going to demo them. So this is an effect, flanging is an effect that could have been 
in the last lecture about delay because it's legendarily originally produced with analog hardware back when analog delays meant among other things a tape analog tape recorder i think most of you may have seen the old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and those were commonly used in studios and what somebody found is if you took two copies of the same signal on analog tape and you played them and you alternately put your thumb on the flange of one tape recorder or the other when you you rest your thumb on the flange of is going to slow down a little bit and so that'll delay the signal sort of a variable amount uh, relative to the other one and then when you go the other way then as you push in there it's going to delay this one and so by sweeping these things back and forth you alternately have the signals a little ahead or behind each other and it turns out that what happens there is something that is called a comb filter in signal processing where different bands are amplified and there's gaps between them and hence like the teeth of a comb and it turns out that if you play two comb filtered versions of the signals like that different frequencies will be reinforced or canceled depending on how these things are against each other and so you end up with an effect that sounds like it's sweeping a filter of some kind through the band. It's kind of a really attractive effect. See what this link tells us. You know, this is a nice discussion of this. And, you know, once you realize that what you're essentially doing is a comb filter, rather than doing it as a simulation of analog plug tape decks by sort of putting a variable length delay line and delaying the signal more or less, then you might choose to actually simulate the flanger sound by using biquad IR all pass filters to get the phase cancellations you want and you change those frequencies. And so the phaser was originally designed as a substitute for a pair of tape decks that you could build in analog hardware with resistors and capacitors and stuff. In the digital world, there's no huge advantage of phasing over flanging in terms of cost of implementation or anything like that. But the phaser sound is different enough from the flanger sound that people still use phaser effects quite a bit in processing audio. The chorus is yet another way of getting a flanger-like effect. You use a multi-tap delay line and you vary the tap positions as you go so that you get, you know, between the dry and wet signal and now you get this delay and frequency shift effect as well. This tends to be a less pronounced effect than the flanger or the phaser, but it's still a pretty noticeable effect. And again, like so much stuff in audio, really people aren't very careful about these names. You may hear something called a phaser that's a flanger or a flanger that's a phaser or a chorus that's a phaser. It's when you see those buttons on a piece of equipment or when you see a box labeled that in the rack, you shouldn't be super confident that what the official-ish names that I just described really correspond to what you're actually getting. There's a lot of folk art here and that's a fun part of, of audio, but it's also a frustrating part of audio. It's hard to talk about things sometimes, and it's hard to know what to expect when you push that button on your fancy digital audio. We've already talked a lot about resampling, and it's not normally just an effect, but an effect is just a thing you have to do. But of course, if you want to, if you want to simulate the old thing 
back in the old days we had something called a record player i guess they're still around and one of the things that record players had after a while was different speeds you could play at and so if you want to simulate the effect of playing faster you can resample the signal to be shorter and then play it at the wrong rate and you'll get a very high pitched sound that sounds like Alvin and the Chipmunks and that can be a fun effect and you can go the other way if you wanted to sound sleepy then what you typically do is simulate the effect of playing your record at a lower speed by upsampling the signal and then playing it at the original sample rate and so you get more samples you get the same number of samples per second but more samples overall and so it's going to make the sound sound lower so that's a that's a common the last big effect is a thing called frequency stretching and what it is is sort of notionally a frequency domain equivalent of resampling you want to be able to maintain the frequency content of a signal by making it shorter or while still making the signal shorter or lo longer so this is the effect that is used when you listen to an audiobook or a YouTube video or something at half speed or double speed you can't just slow it down because if you slow it down it will sound like sleepy if you can't speed it up too much because if you speed it up it will sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks so you can't just change rates here you have to somehow delete or create new content infill in paint essentially in ways that don't distort the original harmonic content of the signal so that it sounds like the same sounds and this is actually a very cutting edge hard kind of effect to produce i've got in in our repo there's a thing called synth kit that has an implementation of time domain uh, frequency stretching and what it does is it tries to find the period of the signal and then it tries to sort of if you want to stretch the signal you add copies of a period you know you interpolate copies of a period so that there's it's the same signal from a Fourier point of view, from a cyclic point of view. There's more of it. If you want to, if you want to shrink the signal, if you want to speed things up, then you delete some periods, and that will get rid of some of the signal. It's hard. It's hard because it's hard to find exactly where the period is. It's hard because when you do find the period, if the sound's complicated then the period may be impractically long, and so you can't actually delete it um, or double it without causing some real problems. But in a lot of situations, it's a good way. It's expensive, but it's not as expensive as the frequency domain method. So the other way to do it is to literally think of audio, uh, audio stretching as, or shrinking as, working in the frequency domain and scaling the frequencies up and down. So you take your DFT, you scale it up or down, you know, so that it covers a, a larger frequency band and decimate or interpolate. And then you take an inverse DFT to get it back. But of course, Fourier uncertainty is a problem. You're going to lose sharp edges in the sound and things like that if you're working exclusively in the frequency domain. And so you can try to do it multi-scale, but that's its whole own hard challenge. While in principle, frequency domain stretching is probably better in practice, people have had more luck in general with time domain, and there's some very fancy methods. And so that's why, as I've mentioned before, if you if your audio is running at a little different rate than your video, then the traditional industry thing to do is to just not try to do this. 
and instead to clip a frame or add a frame to the video every so often to try to match the rates. It turns out your eye is much more tolerant of doubled or skipped frames in a video than your ear is of, you know, messing with your audio signal. And so we typically, when, the, when they're close, we scale the video rather than scaling the image. Uh, if you look at a slow motion track in a movie, you'll see one of two things. You'll see that the audio was recorded separately from the video, or you'll see that they slow down the audio to get that funny toy. And neither one's very satisfactory. You essentially never, I, I don't remember ever seeing in a movie, a situation where they used audio time stretching in a slowed down video sequence. And another name for this is pitch shifting. This is a topic that confused me for a long time. Pitches are log frequency. We'll talk about pitches more in a little bit, but we've already mentioned the fact that, you know, every time you go up an octave, which is a sort of a fixed amount, you double the frequency. And so in that domain, this multiplication of frequencies, the scaling of frequencies in the frequency domain, thought of as pitches, it's sort of pitch shift. You shift the, you add or subtract from the pitch on the keyboard. And so that's, that's kind of confusing. And you'll hear people talk about pitch stretching sometimes, and that's not right. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, and you don't want a frequency shift either. There's a sort of standard implementation of shifting in the frequency domain using an oscillator and taking different frequencies, but you don't want to do that because that's not going to sound right. You want to preserve these harmonic relationships. You want octaves in the stretch signal to be octaves in the signal. And so actually that went faster than I thought. That's some basic effects and I will demo these at some point for all y'all, but I think it's kind of interesting to see that now, now that we have some reasonable understanding of ESP and time and frequency domain stuff, none of these are super incomprehensible. Everybody sort of can get their head, I think, around the basics of effects. And when you find a new effect that you don't understand how it works, I strongly suggest you go find a paper and study it, you know, go find something online and study it and try to understand it. And I think you'll find the vo vocabulary we've built up of frequency domain, time domain, and DSP will let you understand how that effect operates with. So that's what I've got for you on this topic. Uh, we should talk more about it, but things move on quickly. I hope everybody's doing well out there, and I will talk to you again soon.